Southern California, yeah. Born and raised our DNA, laugh and cry to what we say, we hit you with that wordplay. Four, zero, five, three. What episode are we on? D, they feeling like baby zombies, all dressed in Abercrombie. SoCal DNA coming in live, eight o'clock on a Wednesday night. COVID got you sitting inside, why not sip one and free your mind? Cheap thrills, popping pills, stack cash, spend it fast. Listen to all of those lies as Arjun act like he's surprised. surprised. Game two, Dodgers, not looking too well, not looking too well, but as a true baseball fan, true Dodger Blue fan, you know, we got another inning. I think we're going to be pulling out just fine today. I think so. It's 8.40 today, coming in a little later than usual, but at least on a Wednesday. Uh, Arjun's getting used to his new job. Uh, I'm used to my new job, and... uh, we're, we're good to go. Arjun, you want to introduce why this episode is so special to us? Yeah. Ladies and gentlemen, we are indeed giving you a special, special episode today. We teased it last time. Um, you know, SoCal DNA has been on a long journey. We've been uploading on YouTube. We have a logo. We have a theme song. And, you know, we're on Spotify now, too. You would think, what more could we want? <laughs> what else is there to accomplish in life for a so podcast? So much more. So much more. So much more. That is true. And so we thought, you know, it's about time we had our first guest on the show. And, you know, we have many adoring fans, countless. You know, I, I could count them on, on two hands, <laughs> but now it's, it's, it's more. It's more than just 10. Um, but one of them has been a day one supporter. Uh, he's been following the podcast on YouTube, um, on Spotify, just listening pretty much before everyone else, too. And uh, it, it's it's only right that we reward our fans, you know? And so without further ado, uh, let me introduce none other than uh, the esteemed, the expert of many things in life, Zan Bokari. So ladies and gentlemen, round of applause. Round of applause for Zan Bokari. So clap for him. Clap for him. And uh, Zan, why don't you go ahead and uh, say a couple words to the uh, to the audience here? Sure thing. So as a day one listener, I really liked how SoCal DNA has uh, evolved from how it started. Uh, just better chemistry between the hosts and uh, a lot more organized with segments, a lot more structure. So that's nice to see. And I guess I'll start with a little bit about myself. So uh, in, I guess in the podcasting genre, I've mainly been a listener more so than a guest on anything. I think I've been a guest maybe once on a podcast of like an anime convention somewhere for like some raffle, really, really uh, embarrassing moment. But yeah, so I'm in the- uh, Wait, hold on though, hold uh, on though, Zen. Let, let's yeah. hear about this movie. <laughs> I'm kind of curious. Uh, you didn't even get so, too far. You gotta let him finish his intro, bro. No, oh, bro, I, I got questions for that. We got a five question for the guest segment that's oh, coming up okay, soon. Okay. But since you did start this, Zan, I, yeah. tell me a little bit about this incident what happened at the anime convention wait when was this first off can you set it up like give us the context i think uh, 2014 2013 something like that so they have their their panels sometimes for like uh podcasts or for like like youtube shows over there sure so basically they had a a segment where you basically have to uh uh give give an answer to a really stupid question to win a prize and they were giving a bunch of uh I think it was a recess with one of the shows. You remember that show? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So there's recess, and then there was like a lot of like anime that would never sell anywhere. So they were kind of just giving that away. So I can't remember exactly what my question was, but it was just pretty embarrassing. Like I was just hey, that was a I solid just kind of wanted to leave the stage. Yeah. That was a solid know. year for anime, if I remember correctly. I think fourteen or or thirteen or somewhere around there. That's when Tokyo Ghoul came out, right? Yeah, I think that was around then. Attack on Titan yeah. season one was somewhere around then as well. Everyone was dressed up in those uh, those yeah. garbs of all. What do you call them? The yeah, like the, people the recon the, unit. Survi- uh, the survive, yeah, the survival kit. Yeah, yeah. the REI. Yeah. Damn, man! But you, you you don't remember? You, you were just embarrassed, or it was probably like one of those memories that's just like pushed in the back, never to be remembered. Yeah, yeah, more more so like that. Yeah. There we go. And uh, I'm trying to remember what I got. It it was some really mediocre show. It was not memorable at all. But I was just happy that I was on the on the recording. There we go. Because I think my question wasn't as embarrassing. I don't know what my question was either. It's being, I'll probably have to dig it up. I'll, I'll bring it up sometime. But uh, but that was probably my first time on a podcast. But sure. listener-wise, I listened to a, like a bunch of stuff, a lot of genres, a lot of comedy podcasts. I think I listen to like four or five anime podcasts right now. And uh, what else? Sports. Uh, uh, you have obviously Bill Simmons. 
and then the, the Ringer, that's the other network of podcasts. They they have a bunch of stuff. Actually, the the Ringer is Bell Simmons. Now. What's the other one called? <laughs> yeah, I was gonna call you out. I was like, what, what's what's the pay pay, pay 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 per subscription one called for sports stuff, where you pay for the journalism? You mean Athletic? The Athletics? Athletic. There we go. Yeah, yeah Athletic. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, I listened to a couple of theirs. Yeah, there we go. Yeah, yeah no, they're the Athletics. So solid, the they've, been, they've been swooping up pretty much all the top tier talent. Like I. I can only imagine what when Woj's contract is up, he's going to be over there sometime soon. And then there's the the top Patreon. Have you heard of Chapo Trap House? I have not. Tell me more. Tell okay. me more. So that basically originated uh, in I think 2015, 2016, out of kind of like the Bernie Sanders movement. And they just go hard in the paint. They just uh, go after anyone. It sounds like Argentina. They're basically called the dirtbag left. That that's kind of what they've been dubbed, and they like. It sounds like whoever doesn't agree with them, they just, they just go go after them. Yeah, yeah, that's Arjun for sure. Yeah, that's, that sounds like Arjun. Yeah. Arjun, are you sure you're not well, a really executive producer? One, yeah. Uh no, I I I was uh, hardly paying attention for the last two minutes. But let me, <laughs> let, me, let, me let me move on to uh, another question here. Uh, so Zan, I, I, this was great. I, I know you you listened to about thirty different podcasts, including ours. Uh, how do you know the hosts? How do, how did you come to know us? Let, let's talk about that. Sure. I guess I met both of you in Mesa Court. Uh, what year would that be? Oh nine, the golden 10, years. Maybe? Yeah, and I'm trying to remember why. Two thousand eight. I think you just wanted to show me what when Mesa Court was that that far far off land from the, the really uh, Earth like Middle Earth, and the before in Mesa Court. Oh, Zan, did you go to uh, far. did you go to UCI also? I guess so. Yeah, I thought I went to Middle Earth, yeah. but yeah, yeah, I guess I did. Yeah. It's been so long ago. Middle yeah, um, I, I actually remember the, the first time I met him was actually uh, in a chemistry lab. Um, this might have been on like a Thursday night or something. And uh, it was like Chem 1B lab or Chem 1C lab. I forget exactly. Look at you, overachievers. And Damn. No, well, Damn. well I, I, <laughs> that was probably the last chem I ever took in, in college. But um, <laughs> it, it was just, uh, it was interesting because I remember that day I, I had arrived a little later than usual. Um and we had to pick partners. We had to pick like lab partners. And uh, somebody who I was trying to become a partner with, she was already taken by her roommate. And mm. I was like, oh, damn, because mm. I was talking to her earlier that day in the lecture. And so I look around and I'm like, huh. Uh, <laughs> so, so, you know, Shoulders I got to be honest. So like, and everything like, oh, okay. It's like, yeah, this now. okay. <laughs> yeah, it's like, I was like, I was like, like all right. Bad chemistry from the start. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. I was like, all right, our right, slim pickings, but all right, let, let's see what let's see what we got to work with here. And uh, you know, I, I, I say what's up to this guy. Very smart, very smart looking dude. Uh, you know, clearly, you know, he knows what's up. Clearly he's gonna ace this class and clearly he's gonna be, you know, expert on chemistry. And so uh, you know, I, I I talk to him for a little bit and then we become lab partners and one of the first things we have to do is identify where everything is on the floor inside Roland Hall, I think it was, sure. you know, just where the exits are, the stairwell, the, the elevator and everything. And this was interesting because I don't know if Zan remembers this, but I remember, you know, everybody else was kind of going toward one side of the building, like one side of the floor, but Zan was leading me to like a different area. And I think we were looking for one thing. I forget what it was. Maybe it was a fire extinguisher or something, but I realized quickly, oh, okay. You know, maybe maybe I got to take the lead a little bit on this one. You know, everybody else is going over here to this opposite wing. Let me let me uh, tell Zan, hey, let, let's let's try uh, uh, take taking a route over here. And from that day forward, I think we just started working with each other in different capacities, whether it's in class or um, you know, I think one day it might have been that day, Zan, you came over to Laguna, showed you around the dorm, and uh, I think I introduced you to Don, who was living in the first floor. At the time, he was a community programmer with a nice big room in the first floor. Oh yeah. And uh, is Don? Let me ask you this, and I know I'm putting you on the spot here, but what was your first impression of Zan? Zan, I'm gonna be completely honest with you. I don't remember meeting you, my man. Uh, Arjun introduced a, a ton of people uh, to me. I probably remember <laughs> mm, grand total of zero of them. Um. So I apologize on my behalf on that, but you know that, that, that's you were... really that's really more of a diss to me. <laughs> yeah, I was gonna because, say uh, <laughs> because clearly he didn't give a damn about anybody that I would bring to him. It was just yeah. all peasants. No, it, it was like a cat, like a cat bringing you a dead bird. You're like, well, why? 
You don't, you don't <laughs> yeah, like what? What do you want me to do with yeah, this? Like, what do you What do you want me okay. to do? You want me to eat this? I can't. It's dead. <laughs> it's infested with bacteria. It's horrible. <laughs> uh, but but no, Zan. Uh, you know, I you're right. I think it was from fall of 2008. So that's a long time, dude. Like the three of us, in some capacity, we've known each other for like 12 years. Sure. That is a long time. Um, so Zan, I, I I know. Prior to this question, you were telling us about all the different podcasts that you like to listen to. Now, my simple question for you is, man, how do you find the time? Like, how do you keep yeah. up with all this different content? What's the immortal sin? Uh, uh, variable speeds. Oh, really? Do you listen to it at yeah. one five or what, what's your go to rate? One five or two, depending on uh, uh. how much I can retain. Do you ever get I tried three or... before. That's 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 cocaine. You don't do three. <laughs> you come back from three. Yeah. See, I noticed though, whenever I listen to something at like one five or two, um, even if they're speaking at a slow pace and you speed it up, doesn't it lose the ethos of like their personality a bit? Or is it like the first couple episodes you listen to them normal speed, and then you speed them up? Yeah, you start normal, and then like some people like like Malcolm Gladwell, for example, talks real, real, real slow. Yeah. Yeah. yeah so yeah, you yeah. got at least a one point five. Yeah. Got it. Yeah, and, you and I usually try keeping like a transcript or some some words at the same time. Got so it. Got go it. Because if it's really memorable, I'll listen to it at normal speed. But that's kind of where you prioritize your time wise. Sure. It's interesting. What what do you rate? Or I guess like what are your top three podcasts? I mean, obviously, SoCal DNA is coming in dead last. So I'm asking, you know, who's <laughs> who's who's coming in one two three for you? Uh, let me pull up my app. Here, one second. There we go. And this while Zan jo- while Zan pulls up the app, uh. I know, Don, you also listen to a few different podcasts, right? And one of which I is do. Joe Rogan Experience. So. Joe Rogan Experience, yeah. um, which is interesting. They're on a little hiatus right now. because. Uh, Any thoughts on the Spotify experience? Yeah. Have you used the app yet to watch the video? What the hell is that? Yeah, yeah there's that. Uh, I, I used to listen to The Fighter and the Kid, but since some allegations ah. came up with one of the hosts, it's... Oh, the really? Longer, which yeah. which one? Which one? Uh, one, one of the hosts, the older one. I'm not going to call out names. I, I respect this guy. The goat, the goat. <laughs> the goat of that metaphor. Uh, he was uh, alleged for basically sexual harassment and sexual uh, from like the 90s. And they're bringing it up now and it's basically ruined his podcasting career. He's still touring uh, nationwide and doing shows. So he's very successful. Uh, but it just hurts a bit more because he also has a sitcom on a major uh, network that may get canceled because of these allegations but yeah no that's about all i listen to and then i listen to like you know simple news ones in the morning uh, on the drive to work nothing really too crazy uh there's some food ones david chang has one which is kind of a hard listen in the beginning but he's slowly getting used to it now similar to us and uh yeah what about you arden do you listen to any I listen to the SoCal DNA, and uh, really, that's the only podcast I need to listen to. I get my daily content of current events, music, basketball, mm. whatever it may be. Mm. And uh, I know no better podcast than the SoCal DNA. There we go. So there we there's go. the company line that I'm towing for us. I there think so, man. I think so. So, uh, you know, uh, what is it? Promoters? What, what's the term I'm looking for? Uh, 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 what, well sponsors. Look- sponsors. Okay. <laughs> you know, if you're listening here. Arjun right here. He's saying we're the best, so I think you guys gotta sign up. Sign up. But I don't know I don't know if sponsors enjoy me promoting my own podcast instead of the advertising. Well, that, that's the point, man. See sponsors, if you had sponsored us, that awesome little boring soliloquy that Arjun just had, uh it was would awesome, be yours. Though. It would be yours. So, you know, sign <laughs> us up, you know, reach out to us. Uh, any which way, uh, I'll, I'll post Arjun's number worldwide sometime after this podcast, and just go ahead and call, text, anything. By the way, I just want to say before Zan finally tells us his podcast, uh, I'll, I'll say that lately I've been getting all these text messages from like, you know, vote yes on twenty two or vote no on twenty two. Sure. And it, and it's a bit much because it's not just a text message; it comes with a picture of like a like a nurse or like a like a taxi driver or something and it's like yeah. why like why am i getting this much you know messaging i've well, never had this before it's rich you know, people last... million yeah. campaign spending yeah there you go. <laughs> there it is. millionaires trying to influence you man but Come so do them. you guys do you guys get that too like just random messages almost every day from different numbers i mean you can stop get... subscribing but you get different numbers calling you different Dude, numbers I get, texting you. I get phone calls and mail over here in my hood Oh yeah. Um, so like, 
uh, lately it's been picking up, but almost every two to three hours I'll get a phone call from a scam. Oh, wow, that often. Yeah. Wow. So it's, it's not even scamming because I'll pick them up and they'll be like, oh, hey, I'm representing or I'm calling on behalf of representative so-and-so. What do you think about? And I'll hang up at that point. Or so, mm. oh, what do you think about prop something? Uh, yeah, whatever. I already voted. Stop trying. You're wasting your money. On I got that. you. I got you. So, Zan, I, I do want you to bring up the uh, the scamming story that you almost got caught in uh, that you were telling us about before the podcast started. But before we do, go ahead and give us your top five podcasts that you've been listening to. Sure. Uh, what genre? Any. <laughs> okay. I guess we'll start with comedy, the big ones. Joe Rogan. You have heard that. It's a Mark Marin, WTF. That's another one of the OGs. Yeah. yeah. Then there's uh, Bill Burr's. Then Dave Chang, as you mentioned it. Uh, I think it just depends on the guests. Some of those are really entertaining. Yep. Some are just cool to see the inside baseball of that whole uh, restaurant tour experience. Yep, yep. Then uh, JJ Reddick started his own like a uh, podcast company sure. and all. It's called Old Man the Three and the Three. So he left uh, the Ringer and he's kind of started his own thing. Okay. And I think recently he had Steve Kerr on. That was a pretty good interview. Sure. And then uh, Chapo Trap House I mentioned earlier. Really fun politics comedy. And they get a bunch of guests on, really, really entertaining stuff. And then you got uh, Bodega Boys. Have you heard of them? I'm assuming they're from uh, New York. Uh, have you heard of Jesus and Miro? Yeah. Yep. Yeah, yeah. So that's their podcast. It's oh. real fun. It just goes all over the place. They kind of started in radio before their Vice Line show and then before the Showtime show. So it's just kind of them just, uh, they kind of vibe off each other and just keep on going. And it's just constantly funny. And they have like 20 minutes of AKs every episode. Cool. Great. Yeah, I guess I'll, I'll just leave you with that yeah, for right now. Yeah, no, that, that's a fantastic list. That's probably more podcasts than I've ever listened to in my entire life. But I appreciate that, man. It's always great to hear what our listeners like to hear besides ourselves. Um, so going back, <laughs> go, going back to uh, the uh, the scam story you were telling us about. So what, what happened there? Like you almost got caught or you almost got scammed? What was it? No, it's actually uh, I was saved by the uh, the incompetency of my cell phone network. Oh, because you know and, and when you just, do uh, two-step just verification. Let, just to let everyone yeah. know, wh which network are we talking about here? Just call them out. Call them out. I don't want you guys to lose sponsors before you have any. Come on. It's all right. We it lost has so to do it. already. It's a synonym for jogging. Got it. But they no longer exist. Yeah. So, so I don't even know what network it is right now. It's probably in some uh, some it, it's a, middle it's, state. It's one of the other three. That yeah. Yeah. One, one of yeah, yeah, the yeah the the nice purple one. Yeah. Or pink. Sure. So, okay. Yeah. So going back. Uh, okay. So, so talking you know, about they have step verification. <laughs> they yeah. basically texted me. Uh, we want to know how if you're real or not. We're really interested in buying this item. We want to know if you're real or not. So uh, we're gonna text you something and give us a six-digit code back. Got it. And I obviously never received the text from them. So that's all she wrote. Yeah. But I googled it afterwards, and basically they said that if you provided them your cell phone number and the six digits. Like using a Google Voice or something, they could basically ah, uh, uh, so it's facial like, behavior and stuff like that. Yeah, yeah, it's like one of those verification codes. Like, uh, they probably input your phone number somewhere as a proxy to get your password or get into an account that has all your information, possibly. Or... Yep, yep. Ah, okay. I made that connection right now. You gotta apologize. I'm a little slower than usual, which isn't speaking much, but you know, still slower nonetheless. About three drinks in, especially now that uh, my daughter's officially lost, so I'm a little. A little, jaded, a little jaded, a little jaded, little jaded. My bad. Have hey, they lost hey. the series or did they just drop the game? They just dropped the game right now, so it's one one. Oh, okay. okay. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. Hopefully, can, they can go through with it. Yeah. 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 So I'm, I'm, I'm slamming this drink, and another one's ready already. So I'm good to go. So congratulations on your Lakers. Like I can't stand them, but oh, definitely yeah. well worth yeah. winning in the bubble. Too much gold. Too much gold. Too many rings. <laughs> yeah, pretty much. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. You got, you got <laughs> wealth. Yeah. Oh man. Hey, I got to Well, do you have a um? I guess a, a favorite team then? If it's not the Lakers, uh, you're making the San wrong Antonio, choice. Until, until the Detroit Raider left. Come on. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, we got a top five player. You drop that, you never come back. Like, mm -hmm. It's going to take some time. And then everyone's going to retire, but I think they just got to rebuild. But they'll be fine. Yeah. Great fan base. Yeah. One of the best coaches to ever coach. Um, I don't know. Hopefully Duncan is the new coach. Like whenever that happens, you think so? Uh, you, you don't leave. think it's gonna be uh, what's her name? I'm blanking on her name. Becky Hammond. Becky, Becky Hammond? Hammond. I feel like Duncan's be, be, being with them for uh, about the same amount of time, and uh, you think he's, he's just a bigger name? You're trying to attract free agents and stuff like that. You think he's loud enough though? I, I never see him talk. I feel like a coach needs to talk. 
He, maybe he ta- he talks like that, like without words. <laughs> can't read, read the plays. I don't know. Rondo always reads all everyone else's plays. Yeah. The next generation of Zen Master, you know, coming along right there. He's just he's in that zone. You just automatically absorb whatever his thoughts are. <laughs> Pretty much. Be yeah, the thing I the thing I found weird about Tim Duncan last time I saw him on the the Spurs bench, he had this new hairstyle. Hey, I liked it. And and it was like the worst hairstyle ever. I mean, the guy's like, the guy's pushing forty at least. Bro, I'm sure. and, you're saying uh, it's the worst hairstyle? We got to compare your hairstyle to his. And then we'll, we'll take oh, that. I, I, I'm I, I'm sure I'm sure my hairstyle is better than his one because his hairstyle was kind of like you, know, you have Plato, right? You have Plato, sure. And back in the day, you have those like it's almost like a little. Uh, like a grater type of thing where you push the play-doh through and, and, and it just kind of comes out all stringy, right? That's what his hair looked like to me. It, it's more of a young man's haircut, to be perfectly honest. He's still I don't a young expect, man. He's still uh, a young I don't, man. I don't, I, don't, I don't expect a 40-year-old Tim Duncan that pretty much spent most of his career with like a clean-shaved head to yeah. all of a sudden go to like this, you know, 20 year old Migos rap star looking haircut, hey, but like, to each his own. To each I'm liking own. it. I'm liking it. Let him live his life, man. His youth was given up to basketball to entertain us. Let, let him live. Let him live. How, how do you? I was you... expecting him to endorse Bloomberg, and that happened. So it's a year of surprises. Uh, what was that? Sorry, I missed that, Zan. You, uh, uh, no one expected him to endorse Bloomberg, but that happened. So it's a year. Oh, surprises. oh, so oh, you know that's interesting. I I haven't been keeping up with which NBA ballers are endorsing who. Uh, so why do you think Tim Duncan endorsed Bloomberg? So I think he had uh, he had some uh, hand in helping out. I think after a hurricane in the uh, Virgin Islands, where Duncan is from. Mm. Oh, uh, yeah. can you can you blame him then? I mean, dude, that means. Like the guy with the money is supporting your people back home. I think if anyone were to do that for my respective, you know, what like Brea, like people no, supporting no, no, Brea, like Pico and Rivera, Pico... Pico Rivera, you know, okay. like compared to other California states, we're not um, the Santa Ana that you live in, right, or your side of Santa Ana, right? You you wouldn't say that, or like let's say I was native to the Philippines and someone was you know sending money that way. Well, I think I'd be more prone to support them. Just well, like, I guess no further comment. You kind of want a Bloomberg sports sponsorship, so I'll just. Hey, you know, hey, Bloomberg. Now. Hey, dude, uh, we'll, we'll take a we'll take a sponsorship. I, I read your magazine no, from no, time to time. Actually, you know? actually, no, no. I, well, that is true. Don does read <laughs> something, and you know, I I love it when you go. Hey, yo, I read it on Bloomberg today. <laughs> so, by the way, <laughs> yeah, yeah. But 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 that aside, Zan, uh, we will briefly touch on this one, but. You know, obviously, we do bring up politics from time to time on this podcast. Uh, do you enjoy those segments? Do you, do you find that our opinions are refreshing, or are they kind of stale and just mainstream? I think it's always like a minefield to deal with, because sometimes <laughs> you're kind of going over your, your personal policies, which is fine. But sometimes I feel that, uh, I guess you can alienate some people, so it just a, it's a tough battle. Yeah, kind of I win. mean, well, what do you recommend then? Because I, I don't see how you could talk about politics without alienating some people, uh, aside from, you know, general overgeneralizing your opinions, unless you truly stand in the middle. But even if you truly stand in the middle, then you're definitely going to lose, you know, those on the far sides. I think what you can do is, I guess, just stick to, like, the headlines. And then I think that, like, the foreign politics, like the British Parliament thing, because people don't know about that. So I think that's more informative than anything else. It's it. less do- consequential for us. Do you, do and you then follow? the local politics, we have the, uh, uh, not really, just, just what I've heard on uh, your guys' show. Yeah. I followed Corbin a little bit. I like his politics, but uh, beyond that, I think the, the new party is kind of uh, obnoxious. Yeah, it's garbage, right? It, it's, Everything uh, on the yeah, other side of the, the lake is garbage. Like Mr. Star Lord or whatever his name is, I can't stand him. <laughs> no, Don, Don, you're, you're confused because, Don, you thought he was talking about the Johnson administration. He's actually talking about the new leadership of the Labour no, Party. No, no, I'm just talking in general. The whole thing is garbage. <laughs> like, it's not even, I'm not even trying to divide him. I'm just, that's yeah, one yeah, big yeah. group. Just, just <laughs> UK. Just the UK overall. They're just shit. You know, they, <laughs> they produce some good boxers, yeah. but aside from that, let's let's move on. You know? Yeah. <laughs> but then if you're going to go all out, you know, politics genre podcast, like a, like a chop or something, you just, then you should take your side wholeheartedly and, you know, rely on Patreon. Of and then course. you have people who like your stuff listening it. Sure. Then you could just go all out, being a like a what do you call it, milk toast fence hitter. That's no fun. Like, that's not even good listening. That's like, how would you call it, cable news? That's no fun. Sure. So so Zan, even though they have uh, record ratings, like Russia hysteria, I guess that sells, right? Yeah. No, absolutely. So Zan, uh, like, 
what type of political podcast do you like to listen to? So uh, there's just a variety of stuff. So there's that uh, that Tim Pool guy. Have you heard of him? Former Vice guy. So he's more on the right. He kind of called himself a centrist, but like he did say he's endorsing Trump and all. So so it's good to see that side. There's this other guy, Sargon of Cod. There, there's a bunch on the right. I listen to just try to just to see that side. Uh, Steven Crowder is another one. And then uh, on the left, uh, probably. Uh, so there's uh, Chapo. That's the big one. So that's more of the Bernie wing. Wait, the, Chapo? Uh, as in wing, like, I don't really bother. Sorry? Like, Chapo like El Chapo? No, that's just the name. So, so uh, basically, they all started in Brooklyn. They're a bunch of guys from Brooklyn, but right, like right. Uh, they they got the name from El Chapo and then the trap house they got from Trap Music Houston. So, so that's why they kind of came up with the name. Got it. They probably sling drugs too, huh? Yeah, a ton of jokes. You should just definitely check out <laughs> on YouTube. Is so it, like, is it an episode it? on Mayor Pete? You'll just you can't, you won't stop laughing. Like, so, <laughs> like, like you know, whole rat emoji oh, stuff. They started that. Here we go. The okay, rat emoji. <laughs> yeah. Then I gotta ask you though, man. Who is your favorite drug dealer? You got us the King Push. Ah, correct answer. Correct answer. I love it. I love it. Uh, you know, speaking of Pusha T, man, uh, he's been in the game for quite some time. He is a veteran of the hip hop game. What would you say is your favorite song by Pusha T? Well, I guess off the the Daytona album, I really liked. Uh, mm. What's it called? Let, let me pull up the list. It's been some time since so I listened. But I guess the <laughs> recent one, Story of a Dion, that, that was real fun, yeah. Oh yeah, when it, it, that little summer what was, was it last summer or the summer before? It's twenty twenty has fucked up my timelines a bit. But uh, when you had that going on with Drake and that beef, that was taking rap battling to a whole nother level. It didn't though. It really didn't. That's a total <laughs> bullshit take. Because look, a, a real rap battle was what Pac versus Biggie, right? That's a new level. That's that was the level. Sure. What this was between Drake and Pusha T. Although I enjoyed it, I enjoyed hearing Pusha T you know, rap about Adonis over the uh, the track that Jay-Z made, right? I enjoyed all that. I enjoyed Drake's comebacks. I thought Drake's bars were good, too. Which, yeah, but, you know, I'm just saying, or it brought it to a whole nother level, because yeah. I don't think it's... Uh, I don't think we should acknowledge the fact that he called out, you know, uh, a son that was being kind of swept under the rug. That's like personal shit that I believe kind of you don't touch hold on time out time out time out what is your reference for rap beef because every good rap beef gets personal dom and you know this but kids you're gonna talk about include kids in there hey it's it's fair play it's fair play because i think uh... push a t brought this up a while ago like push t was asked hey didn't you go too far i mean come on sure. push like Joe Biden probably asked him, like, you know, yeah, don't a you couple have to draw people the line? Yeah. yeah, don't you have to draw the line somewhere? Exactly. And he's like, you know, it all is fair in love and war. I think that's something that he said. And if it's a real rap beef, nothing's off limits. If you brought up my baby mama, I think that's what that's what she was talking about, right? Like, you know, his fiance. His I think his fiance uh, and the son that was basically a secret to the world at that point. Yeah. So, so okay, when, uh, the counterpoint that that is that is uh, not true. It was actually revealed. I actually did some research on this, and it was revealed on TMZ a lot before. That was public knowledge. If you did a little bit of digging. Oh, see, there you go. It's public knowledge, Don. What, what's your retort Bro, to that? Bro, uh, TMZ, TMZ. Do you trust everything TMZ releases? No, but you know, you know what I do trust. I do trust. <laughs> they had images. I, I listen though. I, I I do trust. I do. I do trust. Don't, don't even get on sources, Arjun. You have a no, bad no, rap no. on sources. I, well, a, a shout out to Oxford. <laughs> Looking for our number one sponsorship, Oxford. Here we go. Let's go. Although, since they're the student journal, I doubt they have much money to it's give all right, us. We'll but... take anything. <laughs> yeah. But so, I, I remember Pusha T said he actually got the information from, I think, Noah, who was the, the in-house producer for Drake. Mm. So, one of Drake's own people actually told, I guess, a girl that uh, Noah was with at the time. And the girl, you know, <laughs> didn't really stay loyal. She kind of Spread this info to Pusha T's people, sure. and that's how Pusha T found out. So to me, it's it's kind of like what Zan said. This knowledge has already been out there. Maybe mm -hmm. it's not broadcasted at the same level, but it's not like Pusha T was exposing something for the first time. Okay. It's been done before. It's, okay, okay. We're just gonna, you know, uh, I just want to we'll say I'm more it. right than you. Uh, you that's go. just a low blow. It's a low blow, and I think it's uncalled sure. for in uh an otherwise fair game 
because that's one of those trump cards that you can't really come back on so if tmz isn't reputable what is i guess according to you that's my next question why is who or why is what i guess if tmz is is not reputable then what would you consider reputable nothing's reputable, as a source honestly uh i, I just said tmz because tmz usually gets a lot of bad rap and they tend to just go for headliners but which... are they wrong are they wrong though because i mean don what, what you're saying is you're basically calling tmz like a wikipedia where it's unsighted and it's not really verified by too many people but what i'm telling you is yeah tmz isn't necessarily oxford student journal but <laughs> but you know i i think if they have pictures as zan says it's got to be real that's good enough right i i guess but that can be a slippery slope man especially with all the things uh zan are you like uh well versed when it comes to like deep fake and everything like that that comes with it yep yeah so like <laughs> technology or just the concept no no just the concept because i think I, I, oh, i'm bringing okay, up a, yeah. a point like okay i get where you guys are coming from but then as time moves on if we continue to believe that oh an image is surfaced and they've got you know information from so and so and so and so that's anecdotal at the end of the day uh with deep fake coming on board and with that technology prospering uh, in the future are we really going to be able to trust that notion that oh we got pictures it's legit well, for images, there's a thing called Photoshop that existed a lot before deepfake. Sure. So, so I guess that's a thing. But uh, I just all I'm hearing is the Drake apologist. So, how did he really? To that? I didn't even know he apologized. Oh. I thought he just cowered and no, 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 no. He's, he's dissing Drake you, fucker. Don, he's dissing you. He's calling you a Drake apologist. Oh, yeah. I don't really care. <laughs> hey, Drake. Hey, by the way, hey, I'm your supporter. Just sponsor me. <laughs> I'm gonna get that yeah, deal, or what's yeah, it? I'm just saying, hey, if the money OBL, comes, I don't know what if the money comes, so we're Bloomberg. Right? See, I'm, I'm gonna support it, dude. Hey, if the money comes, by all means, yeah, I'm gonna sell up. I don't care. Hey, man, th this reminds me of like uh, the whole <laughs> oh, no, <A> the HIV. <laughs> <laughs> hey, I'm serious, Zan. All right, here. A yeah, question here we go. Let's ask, him. Let's ask him. Yeah, yeah. A question was posed to me. Um, you know whether or not I would. Uh, get purposefully infected with like hiv or let's just say like an advanced form of hiv uh one that was incurable uh how much money would it take for you to do that so it's incurable incurable you're not okay. necessarily gonna die from it but you know you will have the repercussions so you got that magic johnson disease. medicine going on then i'm saying okay let's just say a cure won't come out for you know, at least until you're in your senior oh. years. Okay. How much money would it take for you to take that injection and shove it into a vein of yours willingly? Probably wouldn't take it, yeah. You wouldn't? Not even the, a suffering, billion suffering dollars. Suffering would be too much. A no, billion dollars? You're, much, you're not going to die from it. But the suffering. Like, you yeah. don't want an eternal suffering. Yeah. And that's, that's, I guess it's because I'm financially trained, man. The financial freedom you could achieve with just a couple million dollars to not have to work day in, day out, whether or not you enjoy your work, would free up so much of your time and your quality of life would go up enormously that it would offset whatever. You just feel like doing regime have. change elections and being a Bloomberg? N no. <laughs> I, 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 I don't get the appeal. Yeah, I, I guess I, uh, views of money are very different. It's I think okay. You, you know, that, that, that's quite all right. I, I think the point here is Zan is kind of a, a whore when it comes to doing things. I'm not Zan. <laughs> oh, I was going to say. Sorry, I fuck... <laughs> I'm the one drinking, not you. <laughs> I, I was reading another article. That's why my, my mind got a little flipped there. But Don, he will pretty much do almost anything. For it's money. not a whore for money. It's having the financial freedom to know that my family will be taken care of generations after me hey, look, i'm not against horrors i'm not against prostitutes. <laughs> no and i you... just want you guys to understand like yeah. as much as you guys will disagree to the fact i think it's a little selfish because you're not taking into account the fact that those around you will prosper from your own suffering and i think that selfless nature that i have may be skewed a bit because it's tied to money but in my opinion if money were not a problem in one's life, it would get rid of 90% of your problems day to day, at the very least. So why not do that for those around you? For a mild encumbrance of basically having the flu all the time and maybe losing a leg here and there, whatever. Well, there's also COVID going around, so comorbidities are 
like even worse these days. It'll probably take you out. Hey, with enough money, it doesn't matter to me, dude. I'll, I'll die happy. No, you're gonna cryogenically freeze yourself or something. Uh, make a phone I, or something. I wouldn't even do that, dude. I'll just say bury me with my middle finger up in the air t- with a note that says "fuck you, Arjun and Zan for not agreeing with me." You know. <laughs> That means the podcast is dead. That seems to be a lose lose. <laughs> no, you take over. It'd be uh what is it? A and Z? Yeah, that's a pretty good no. side, by the way. No, let's, A and Z Z Z N A? No, let's let's uh let's let's go back to the questions. How about that? Um so getting to know our guest, right? We covered the sports. We know Zan is a San Antonio Spurs fan. Uh and we covered how we all met, uh going back to 2008 2009 which is a long time and we also covered how zan keeps up with all these podcasts which is really impressive um now we want to get into a little bit more fun stuff zan what would you say is your favorite food as don looks at his messenger chat uh what would you say is your favorite food i guess give me a cuisine that would help narrow down because i don't think i have an exact favorite but if you give me a cuisine that would help out okay um let's start with uh filipino cuisine Filipino food. I don't think I've had that much. I've just had that one fast food. Was it Jollibee? How's oh, Jollibee? It's fucking good. Jollibee's great. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, you know what's up. Yeah, I think the fried chicken at Jollibee is actually pretty solid. Uh, I wouldn't put it on the same pedestal as like a Popeyes, maybe, but it could stand toe to toe to like a KFC or a Church's. I think, depending on who cooked right. it and when you got it, from when it's come out of the oil. Yeah, I'm trying to see what other Filipino food I've had. I probably had something here and there. I just don't remember the name of a specific dish or anything. Maybe UCI, because I remember we had that Olympic chef that first year, and he'd make everything, pretty much. Yeah, yeah. The big dude, right? I, th- I think he was a bigger dude. I'm trying to play. Yeah. Damn. And I think they got rid of him because he was being too nice, or the portions were too great. I don't even know. Yeah. Why would you go down from an Olympic chef? Come on. <laughs> what about Indian food? Or what is it? Bangladeshi food? What, what, what's the, the right term that I'm looking for? No, well, I there are many back. terms for many regions. India has so many provinces, right? Yeah, so I guess Indian as, as a like a subcontinent. Yeah. Okay, sure. Uh, so really, like, uh, have you had the masala dosa before? Dosas. The big, uh, yeah, yeah, it's a uh, the, the yeah, super. Yeah, 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 I really like that. Yeah. Nice. Yeah, and then I tried this thing called Chicken Sixty Five, which is pretty interesting. So that I think that's a later creation. That is like kind of like a, a sweet and sour chicken, but kind of spicy. So so I tried that recently. That was pretty cool. So then, uh, what, what was it called again? Chicken sixty nine, was it? Sixty five. Sixty five. <laughs> oh, got it. Got is there it, is there any <laughs> is there any point for the sixty five? I, I was like thinking in my head, it's like a fuzz. Yeah. So I looked at the Wikipedia. There's no decisive thing, but either it started in nineteen sixty five. They use sixty five chickens. They use sixty five parts of a chicken. Like it's inconclusive. <laughs> I, I didn't know a chicken had sixty five parts. To be honest. Yeah, I, I don't really know. Huh. But it's an wow. interesting creation. And then obviously the samosas, those that they're pretty fun, and just a lot of those appetizers. Yeah. Cool. So, so, so Zan, uh, you yeah. know, of course, that Don is a entrepreneur of sorts beyond the podcast. He also runs a, a side company called Boonso. And uh, Boonso specializes in a lot of Filipino cooking, but they fuse the recipes with a lot of other dishes, too. I think Don can probably describe it better than I can. I have yet to try it myself. But from the pictures I see on Instagram and from the stories he tells me, his food is pretty good and it sells well, too. Um, let me ask you this. What type of dish, Zan, would you want to see Don make that maybe is kind of out of the ordinary? It's something new, something like that's not classic, but maybe a twist on something, right? So given everything that you told us about your fandom of Jollibee and how much you love the crispy fried chicken and how much you like samosas and doses and everything, what would be something that you'd want to see Don create and add to his Bunso menu? Sure. So uh, I'm trying to remember what I was watching. Uh, it was it was one of those cook those uh, food shows on Netflix. Uh, they were showing, I think, uh, in Vietnam, how uh, so there's a big Vietnamese population in Houston. Sure. And they they had the, that French influence so yep. back when they uh, brought back some of the dishes back to Vietnam. Mm-hmm. They kind of did like a. Was it like a banh mi, mm-hmm. but with like kind of like a Cajun style, so kind of like a fusion elements there, and some of them are using the po boy bread as well. Sure. So some kind of fusion thing like that, yeah. So some just, kind just of like it's different uh, breads and then any topping really, any filling, yeah. Yeah, I got it. Yeah, yeah, and usually comes with like pickled veg, some sort of main protein. Some, often it comes with some sort of a spread that's liver based or heart based, something like that. Yeah. Yes. All for it. I have something similar already. Uh, we call yeah. it the. Uh, what, what did I call it? I called it something weird. 
it was like the longanisa slammer or something like that where uh, we oh. use our traditional filipino bread we call it bundesal but i make it in a way where it's kind of like a hamburger bun so it's a little more receptive to those that you know don't know filipino food and then i had some pickled veg pickled daikon pickled carrot pickled peppers on top of a sweet and spicy sausage that's uncased but treated like a smash burger so, so something similar to that but i can see where you're going yeah with it. yeah I guess you can just make little changes here and there, but yeah. I think what you have, I just have to definitely try it first. Like, For sure. Have a better idea. Another thing we have is this place called Red Line Pub, which I had seen on uh, that Guy Fieri show, the Diner Dives and Drive Throughs, I think it's called. Yeah, yeah. Or something like that. And uh, so they have a place called Red Line, which is kind of like a British pub, but they have like Indian food and like fusion food. Sure. So they have like, they'd have like quesadillas, but with like tandoori chicken. Sick. That and like a lot awesome. of interesting uh, fusion stuff. So it's a lot of creativity there, just making them different. Cuisines, yeah. Absolutely. What do you, do you think it's uh, it's okay to bastardize cuisines that way? Uh, I think uh, when it comes to British food and Indian food, there's a pretty well mix already. But when you brought up the quesadilla, you're, you're clearly mixing uh, a little bit of Mexican influence with that of Indian influence or, you know, watered down Indian influence. Do you think that's okay? Yeah, I think I go with the David Chang philosophy on that. Like there's, there's no good being a purist, you know, just yeah. try what you can try and yeah. I guess capitalism as, dictates if it sells yeah. you. Yeah, as long as it's delicious and yeah, no, uh, we see eye to eye on that one. Just like you got the Kogi tacos, like that's one of the best fusions ever and that's oh, become yeah. a huge business. Yeah, definitely. You know, I met the guy that owned it, not Roy Choi, the actual owner himself, Mark. The dude's really solid, really cool down to earth people. It's one of the reasons why I got into food, um, just to know that. You know, you don't necessarily need that full entrepreneurial spirit in order to become an entrepreneur. And you could, you know, reach millions, become iconic, almost nationwide, um, if you really just put forth a good product. It's interesting. Right, because you've heard of a lot of disaster fusions, but I guess if it clicks, then you just go with it. Exactly. And then maybe expand the menu later. Yeah. Yeah. Hell yeah. But I guess with the food truck scene, uh, how do you... How, how do you see that uh, working in the long term? Because I know I think, in uh, like COVID, it's doing really well. Yeah. Like people are looking for something different. Yeah, and I think it's 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 reached its phase. It's already plateaued. Um, what I think the new norm will be, or the new trendy thing, is going to be these kind of food markets or beer gardens uh, for you know those less entwined with it, where they have a bunch of vendors or a bunch of smaller restaurants renting out little smaller spaces. Uh, in a collective sort of area so it's similar to that of a food truck sort of you know parking lot but it is an actual venue that showcases 20 30 different foods or desserts or drinks uh, so rather than having the food truck come to you i think uh, our, our generation the millennials are looking for the experience more so and they're willing to drive out to it so it saves those in the restaurant industry or those that are more restaurateur like a little bit of money where I don't have to maintain, uh, you know, a, a bucket on wheels. I actually have a legitimate kitchen at a certain location where people know where to find me. So you're saying it's good to have the, the kitchen kind of on its own, but then the delivery system can be a variety of markets. And yeah. Stuff like that. Yeah. And I think uh, the way that it's going, it, the cleanliness part is what's going to be big. I think COVID's going to even push that some more because everyone's scared of germs more so than no usual one. The food industry uh, is very prone to, you know, certain viruses getting within the food without us even knowing, right? It's up uh, in the supply chain, higher up that us as chefs can't even control. So I right. think yeah. having that ability to have an actual legitimate kitchen rather than some makeshift one on four wheels uh, will work wonders when it comes to that. But like pre-COVID in Boston, I was able to go to one of those markets, I forgot what it was called. Sure. It was kind of like an outdoor, like a bunch of different Asian foods. And yep. they created these spots for Instagram and all, really cool setup. Yep. And I think it's super cool because it, it gives people a venue and you're not sitting on a sidewalk, you know, or you're not just taking it to go. Like you could actually enjoy it with a group of people and experience it as a whole while still maintaining the whole Instagrammableness of it and, you know, being first to do it like every hipster nowadays wants to do. Uh, that, I think that's where it's going to go. And you probably have more space for distancing as opposed to a food truck where the yep. lines would probably be a nightmare these days. Yeah, no, absolutely. That's cool. Yeah. Arjun, what do you think? 
Oh, I think we should move on to the next topic. Um, <laughs> so, I am curious, Zan. You are a aficionado of anime. You are somebody that frequents anime conventions. You watch many different animes. Maybe in the past you watched more than that. Uh, what is one particular anime that you'd like to discuss? Okay, so I guess I'll start with one of the classics, uh, Neon Genesis Evangelion. Have either of you heard of it? Yep. Heard of it, watched it, didn't understand it when I watched it. Uh, I'm pretty sure Arjun's takes a little more uh, complex than mine, though. Okay. <laughs> Go ahead. Wait, what? What was it? What was it? <laughs> He's never watched it. He, he doesn't watch anime. He believes they're for children. Uh, no, I, I don't think I don't think they're for children at all. I think a lot of anime are for adults. And uh, you know, Zan, are you familiar with any adult anime? Uh, like 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 genre wise or for yeah, older let's, let's, uh, let's, people? Oh, well, older age people? Is that what you said? Oh, older aged, older aged, like mature. I guess that's let's, term let's say mature. PG thirteen well, versus an NC seventeen. I guess. Well, so in 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 anime, right? Is there like a genre? For anime that's uh, kind of geared toward adults, I forget if there's a name for it. I don't. I don't really know. Um, yeah, that's called hen- hentai. That, that has oh, name. Okay. Yeah. So, which okay. actually means I think pervert in Japanese. It's kind of a catch-all term. Yeah. Ah. So, so this anime that you're watching does it classify as a hentai anime? The the Eva. Well, I think I, I think Eva in and of itself didn't didn't touch hentai. Uh, there were some animations in there that could be pushed a little bit further, right, Zan, about um, to reach that level. But there were definitely, uh, I guess, fan art made where Ray especially was uh, treated in a hentai manner, I believe, right? Have you seen those? Yeah, they, they use the term uh, doujinshi, and uh, yeah. I guess I'll end, end that there because it can get in dicey territory. But uh, I guess I'll go into the, the primer on the series. So uh, the studio is called Gainax. It was one of the earlier uh, animation studios that kind of specialized in the method camera. <laughs> and, uh, what's so funny? No, no, it's just it's just the 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 studio name. Say it one more time. Gainax. Oh my god, Gainax. That 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 is Gainax. Okay, with a G. Sorry. Oh, got it, got it. Okay, go ahead. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah, so it came out in '95, and it's basically a different take on the mecha genre, which is basically the big robots. And, like the catchphrase of the show is "Get into the robot." So you probably heard that if you've, I guess, been around meme culture or whatever. But yeah, so that started in 1995. And the new approach it took to that genre was it's more of a psychological approach. People have compared it to like Carl Jung and Sigmund Freud. A lot of elements there. And then from the title, it has a lot of uh, references to Judeo-Christianity. So so that's just going into the title. And it's a little bit of a plot, uh, a plot coverage. So the time period in the show is 2015, and they've had an extinction event called the Second Impact, and you're in a city called uh, Neo Tokyo 3. Mm-hmm. So from there, you meet the main character named Shinji Ikari, and Good he's been kid. abandoned from his, uh, from, yeah, from, from his dad for a while, and now his dad summons him to pilot this mecha called Eva Unit 1, and he doesn't at that point he doesn't really know why he's doing this but he's reluctantly doing it and he feels like he can help repair his relationship with his dad so the series kind of starts there and they're battling these uh invaders called angels mm-hmm. so that's a uh, basic premise uh two other relevant characters are reya Inami, who is another child who has a similar uh, destiny as shinji in terms of piloting these evas and then uh, asuka who's uh who's uh, part German, and I think she's part American, and she speaks uh, German and Japanese. And she's kind of different than the other two. She's more, like, fiery-tempered. Yep. And she's been a child prodigy. Like, she's been wanting to pilot an Eva from day one, mm-hmm. as opposed to the others. So then, so uh, going quick, back... Zan, uh, Zan, yeah. quick, quick question. So uh, I, I could be totally off on this one, but Evangelion, right? So th- this is kind of like the evangelical Christian. So, like... What's the Christianity component of this anime? Like, how does it all tie together? I think you need to talk sure. about the seeds. So we have Adam, Eve, we have Lance yeah. of Lodge and the Dead Sea Scrolls. So, so that's all, all I can reveal without going to spoiler territory. But there's a lot of those themes and elements throughout. Yeah. Think of it like there's there's like two races, more or less, and they're based off of Adam and Eve separately. 
it's 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 complicated. Mm. And I think the exact title I was reading, the director kind of just named it at random, because you do stuff like that. Because if we just go back to the, uh, let me first finish the character. So we have uh, Gendo Akari, who's the dad of Shinji, which I mentioned earlier, and he's running this organization called Nerve, which is doing this uh, thing called the Human Instrumentality Project. So a lot of crazy research and all we don't know about at this time. And he basically wants these prepubescent kids for some reason to pilot these robots and uh, battle it out with these angels. And then another relevant character is Misato. So she's kind of the caretaker and the commanding officer who's the uh, direct superior to Shinji, Asuka, and Rei. And she's a big time alcoholic as well. And she has a penguin named Pen Pen. And I think, uh, I mean, that's a great character. Far. Yeah, I mean, like, how many animes can you think of where there's always, like, some sort of comedic uh, character that's somewhat of a main character or off, like, side character that, you know, I feel like every anime has one of those, right? There's, like, Kakashi, who's the perv in Naruto, that you have in FLCL, the aunt or older sister who's a perv and alcoholic. I think every good anime kind of has one of those, no? Yeah, that's pretty common. And another thing for, for Eva that's really made a revolutionary is the character designs and the archetypes we see with these main, like the main children characters and Misato and Gendo. Those are pretty much recycled from a lot of later anime. Sure, yeah. So that's uh, really big. I think it was very... And then there's like a lot of clinical depression and mental issues because the director himself, uh, Hideaki Anno, he's kind of going through that and he tried canceling the show who knows how many times. Sure. A lot of the episodes he kind of wrote at the last minute. And then he kind of had a fight with the studio afterwards because the show made a lot of money and they kind of didn't know what to do with it and they're kind of mismanaging it. So uh, so after the show, uh, he basically had to redo the ending in a thing called End of Evangelion. Mm -hmm. Which, so, to be honest, uh, I, I didn't watch that one. Yeah. I, I kind of like to stay yeah. on the canon of everything. Um, well, that was actually necessary because there were like death threats coming to the director. Yeah, and yeah. It, the original Wait, ending was very psychological. That was more kind of like battle type ending. Yeah, yeah. So he kind of did that, yeah, without going too much into spoilers. And then in the, uh, I think, uh, 2010s, they started doing the rebuild films. So the director, Hideki Anno, started his own studio called Studio Kara. And they basically did the whole series again, but like uh, through a different animation and uh, through different stylings. So the first rebuild film, which was a 1.11, was kind of like the first season done again and then the second one was i think the last batch of episodes done again and the third one they had a new plot and some new uh, characters etc and the fourth one i think comes out this year so that's kind of another approach he's taken to the whole thing got it and it's gonna but be canon wise i think uh, just to stick to the original series which is on uh, netflix and then the uh end of eva film is also on netflix so that's a good entry point uh, 26 episodes i believe yeah, and I think Eva was a, a very influential anime uh, for our time. Uh, it was kind of in our younger days. What, do you think any anime of today or, you know, the past couple years can even compare? In genre or in influence? In influence. Influence in terms of longevity, in terms of popular culture, probably Attack on Titan. Yeah, Attack on Titan's up there. Do you think anything right now that's currently running? Will ever meet that? Like, I think Demon Slayer. I know they have an Inuyasha level. prequel. That, that was another seminal series from Adult Swim Days. Inuyasha. Sure. Yeah, but that's so, relatively seeing, uh, older, right? I'm, I'm talking like newer, newer, newer. No, they, they have the prequel out right now. So, oh, so really? Come back into the uh, the zeitgeist. Ah. And then other new stuff. I don't know. Maybe a few years back, we had uh, there was a show called uh, Death Parade. I really enjoyed. Did you hear about that one? Yeah. 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 Yeah, so that was actually interesting. It was uh, like an experimental OVA, which is kind of like a short sure. uh, one of animation, which they basically made into a series. And I thought that was very ambitious in what it did and the way it uh, kind of showcased uh, the afterlife as a bunch of games. So like billiards and arcade games and a variety of things and really cool use of flashback. Got it. Do you typically watch just, uh, I would say, uh, story heavy and very plot twisting animes or do you enjoy the slice of life kinds? I really enjoyed like School Rumble and Planod. I love the, uh, what was the studio, the Kyoto animation. It just looks amazing. Got it. Yeah. I, so you, I, so you I, overall. Now I prefer older protagonists and more thinky thinky, like, kind of like Monster or like Got Space it. Brothers, stuff like that. Got it. So you're, you, you don't. Uh, closet yourself with just one particular genre you kind of just go around see what's hot 
Are you like me where you give uh, maybe each anime whenever they release in the new season maybe an episode or two? Yeah, I try, I try to do that. I try to give it there the benefit of the doubt. That's and then I after that, there's a lot of good review materials you can check online, scores, yeah, etc. definitely. For just friend recommendations, I trust them more than some random reviewer on the net. So if Arjun were to suggest an anime to you, you would uh, give it one or two episodes? At minimum one, yeah. Uh, that's good. That's good. Arjun, do you have any animes to also, recommend? That's, that's talk material as, as well, yeah. You talk that's material? Talking. No, I mean I mean talking oh, for conversation. Oh, got it, got it, got, got it. it. Like, like we're rewatching a show from 20 years ago, like Eva or something, then... That kind sure. of brings that back into my interest, yeah. Definitely. Yeah, um, I think I think one anime that I never got a chance to watch because I simply do not have the time, uh, Dragon Ball Super. I know they rebooted <laughs> the whole Dragon Ball series recently. Uh, Zan, have you started that one? Have you, have you checked it out? I think I stopped a Z at the Frieza saga, I think. Oh, it's so just you, not my you, like, I know it's a cash okay. cow for Funimation, wow. and it's one of the biggest shows ever, but it just never was my thing, yeah. Got you, got you. Not really a Dragon Ball type of person. Uh, were you more into the Pokemon and Digimon of the world? Did you like those? I, I really liked the original seasons, the original uh, uh, cast. I felt like the plot was good. And the, kind of the gimmicks were kind of, kind of new then. But like the, the Pokemon of the week or like the kind of reveal that they have to stuff this many people in an episode around the ad break, around the sugary cereals. So so that, that was kind of nice. And I think everything's on Netflix now, so that's great. Yeah, If you ever want to catch up on that stuff. And then Yu-Gi-Oh! I found more interesting, actually. The whole uh, Egyptian mythology and all that stuff going around in Season 1. Yeah, Yu-Gi-Oh! was dope. Uh, to be honest, man, like, I watched almost everything that was on Saturday mornings back in the day. Uh, started with Pokemon, Digimon came along, which was amazing. I love the early <coughs> seasons. Um, then there was Yu-Gi-Oh! Yeah, uh, I remember even, like, buying those cards. I mean, I'm sure Dom did as well, right? Yeah, I still those, have them uh, around here somewhere. <laughs> oh one of these days we should uh bust that shit out yeah dude. summon the dark magician no hey i gotta tell you man that was like one yeah. of my first packs i think uh I, I for some odd reason my parents were like all right fuck it we'll get them a couple packs i got three packs of Yu-Gi-Oh, uh -huh. and uh one of the packs kid you not had a dark magician and this was like during the first season when dark magician was all yugi used and i was like oh my Damn. god i'm so into it so i i was totally sold on Yu-Gi-Oh forever that is so cool, man. I, I remember, I probably shouldn't be saying this on the pod, but uh, back in the day, you know, we had these summer school programs, right? Uh, there was a session called like, Gifted and Talented Education. And, uh, you know, pretty much kids from all the different, you know, gate programs from all these different high schools would come and, uh, you know, meet up at, at some other high school for the summer and, and kind of like, a, you know, take a collection of classes where you can be creative, where you can learn things, that kind of stuff. And over there, there was this one kid who had a lot of nice Yu-Gi-Oh cards and stuff that wasn't out yet in America. You know, he had bought shit from Japan. And I, I was watching the show at the time. And like, you know, I, I don't remember seeing like the Great Sage, which is like Time Wizard, if you guys remember that one, yep. plus Dark Magician combined together. Like they're, they're polymerized or some shit. And uh, you get this like old ass dude that looks really regal with like a, you know, purple cape and shit and that's like one of the best magician cards ever and i was like wow i gotta get that i gotta find a way to get that and so um i plotted a scheme oceans 11 style where i was basically setting up this guy setting up this kid to eventually take half his cards and he would he would always bring like this huge portfolio sure. lock and key with like all of his decks and boosters and, and custom made things and i was like man this guy's always showing off and we can never beat him straight up because we got all these shitty american cards and it's only on season two in america they're already on <laughs> season eight like they have the great sage and like like quadruple headed white dragon you know what i mean like they, they they're just fucking up everything and, and so um you know we had this plot where like i would face him you know i would duel him and, and like i would basically distract him with some conversation and just like you know the gameplay and slowly but surely our friends or my friends rather would come by one at a time and take a few cards from his box oh, not not dude. all together yeah oh, yeah yeah you're, you're a gang leader at that point man and and <laughs> well no comment there and then afterward after the duel was done you know, uh, my friends had all ghosted. They had just left. <laughs> and, and of course, you know, my, my opponent, he was looking at me the whole time. He knew I didn't take anything. And he was like, huh, you know, my, my box feels a little light. 
I'm like, oh, really? Does it? Huh? Maybe, maybe check under the table. I don't know. Maybe, maybe it's <laughs> play coy. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, play real coy, right? And, and then, uh, you know, I felt bad about it a little bit, but let me tell you the reward, man. Because the plan was to meet up at this like adjacent classroom, dump all the cards, and everybody goes free for all. That's exactly what we did. I got lucky, man. I got the dark magician girl. I got the great sage that I was eyeing at. I got Osiris, man. I finally got that red dragon. You know what I mean? That god card. I got Osiris, man. It was awesome. It was awesome. But then later on, I, I think it got kind of worse because he uh, brought his mom to the classroom. Like at the end of the day, you know, the parents come and pick up the kids. I think his mom was like looking around and his mom was kind of suspecting everybody. Like, oh, it was probably him. Start pointing out the dark kids and everything. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> I mean, I mean, in this case, the stereotypes were true, but I, of course, I wouldn't. I wouldn't confirm this. I wouldn't confirm this. But that was. Uh, yeah, I felt bad about that. I mean, I I haven't thought about it in years, but it sucked. I, I'm sure karma has gotten back to me in different ways. I'm sure the universe has restored himself. Probably that kid went on to, I don't know, maybe win multiple tournaments and get all those cards back. Hopefully. Hopefully he's had a nice life, but that was my one epic heist from back in the day. Uh, and it's tied to Yu-Gi-Oh! This one anime that I, I really enjoyed, you know, watching the dumb version on uh, Kids WB, I think it was. Yeah. Um, but, you know, anime aside, I know we can, or you, you two can talk about anime until the cows come home. But what I want to talk about is something we touched on earlier, creativity, right? You were talking about creativity in food, but I want to talk about creativity in music, because as you know, man... There's a lot of different kinds of artists out there, a lot of different poets, and some music, some, you know, talent out there is just really creative with their wordplay and the stuff that they use to describe their, their personal lives, personal stories. And for those that don't know, one interesting thing about Zan is he's actually really into poetry and he writes amazing stuff. Now, we're not going to put him on the spot and have him read anything that he has, you know, in the tuck, but what I thought might be kind of a fun challenge for Zan is to actually read somebody else's poetry and give us his interpretation of it. So, Zan, are you down for that? We're going to give you a couple of verses, and we just want to see your thoughts on the verses. Sure. It's All no right. mumble rap, right? Okay, there we uh, go. Yeah, no mumble rap. So, what we're going to do... So, I went ahead um, and uh, copied it into our Discord. Oh, it? shit. Is it the first verse, Don? Is is that what you did? No, you didn't, huh? Uh, actually, Zan, don't, don't read that one. Um... Actually, okay, fine. Fuck it. Let's just let's just go with it. So, Zan, in the Discord, go ahead and read, uh, you know, what it says. Go ahead and read it out loud one time, and then I just want to hear your overall thoughts. Like, what do you think the guy's talking about? And we're going in blind, not knowing who wrote it, right? Exactly. Yep. Got it. Nor, nor do we know the timing of it or anything of that sort. When it was written, all that. Okay. You painted the town red. Now everyone in the town's dead. You and I win again. Best friends till our last breath. Live by the gun, die by the gun. Live by the sea, live while we're young. Take from the rich, give to the poor, run to the hills, run from the law. Ride shotgun with our crossbow. Head north where the sun grows. Start fresh where they don't know. The things we did, the stick up kids. We laughed, we cried, we lived, we died. We came. We saw, we conquered them all. Okay, so uh, do you want to go line by line or just line by them? line? I want to go line by line. Okay, sure. So painted the town red. I think that's probably a blood symbology of some sort. They usually use the red, color red either for blood or for fertility. I think from what I've seen. Oh wow! And okay. then everyone in the town's dead. Yeah, so it probably is the blood thing. Okay. So looks like there is some kind of shooting event going on or murdering and some of dead people. So then uh -huh. you and I went again, best friends till our last breath. So I'm not sure who the you and I is right now. It could be, could be a friend, could be uh, a part of their subconscious or uh, something in their mind, maybe a character in their mind that they're talking to. So then live by the gun, die by the gun. I feel like that's a very common phrase that is used like an idiom so uh, given the context i don't know what it means right now i mean i'll see as we go along sure live by the sea live while we're young so they have some kind of a youthful exuberance associated with the sea maybe um kind of a, like a beach body type thing kind of enjoying uh, that youth that memory take from the rich give to the poor 
So that's uh, pretty directly the whole uh, Robin Hood story. Uh, run to the hills, run from the law. So kind of like a run and run away, Bonnie and Clyde type of scenario. Ride shotgun with a crossbow. So now we bring in the crossbow. I feel like that's a lot of the zombie, uh, zombie genre stuff. And they're riding shotgun. So someone else is driving the car. Head out north where the sun grows. So the sun growing means the sun is uh, moving. So we have the passage of time. And as it's growing, we're coming uh, near to the dawn and heading out north. So that could be the North Star, I think. Oh. Then uh, start fresh where they don't know. The things we did, the stick up kids. So stick up could be a reference to the word stuck up. So a different tense. Mm. Or stick up could be more perseverant. They're sticking up to an ideal. Got it. And then uh, we laughed, we cried, we lived, we died. So that's the full cycle of life. We came, we saw, we conquered them all. So either they are uh, conquering uh, memories or they're conquering uh, this battle. It looks like a, maybe like it's a video game battle, maybe a Call of Duty or something. Mm. Mm-hmm. Or it could be a depiction of a war, wartime uh, scenario where uh, the whole cycle goes through kind of dying for someone else, someone else's war. And they head out with North Star, so they head out with the pure intentions where the sun grows, so where their uh, leadership is taking them. And uh, they felt like they're noble, the stick of kids. They felt like they have the pure heart uh, and uh, they're moving forward. And in the end, they feel uh, like they don't have too many regrets because they felt like they conquered them all. So they conquered all these fears, all these anxieties. And they've also painted the town red. So even if there's some negativity to that phrase, I feel like by saying we conquered them all, they feel like there's some accomplishment there that they've kind of left their mark on the town. Wow. Wow. That was deep, man. I I, I didn't even look at it that way. I, I didn't even think of it as like a war going on and, you know, having some kind of a conquest through that. Now, you, you touched on a couple of things here, man. Painted the town red. I think initially you were thinking of fertility. Uh, what, what did you mean by fertility exactly with the color red? Sure. So uh, I guess women wearing red dresses and all. That's a common symbol for fertility. And then I think red's also royalty and sometimes blue as well. This is just common uh, po- poetic symbolism. Mm. Oh, wow. Um, did you also think that maybe painting the town red could simply be the expression like, oh, we're going to have a ball. We're going to go crazy. We're just going to you know, do it all tonight. But they wouldn't use the uh, red because red has, uh, I guess, it's an interesting choice of the word red. Because the other way we could look at it is if it's not violent, but maybe graffiti, but then we go straight into death after that. So I'm assuming there's some kind of blood being uh, painted the town red. And I think that's a line from the Joker as well. He said oh. that line before. So. Wow. Yeah. Wow. So line two. When it says now everyone in the town's dead, did you take it as a literal dead? Uh, if, if we're looking at a, the war angle, yes. Otherwise, uh, another way of seeing, uh, I think there's a quote that you die twice. I don't know if it's Kobe Bryant or someone. Once is when you when you die, and then once when they don't remember your name anymore. So if we're looking at that version of dead, um, you basically uh, made the town look so unrecognizable that no one recognizes it. So that's why everyone in the town is dead. Like mm-hmm. it's dead to them. Mm, that's so I guess that's another interpretation there. But I think it's pretty literal when they go into the war, die by the gun stuff, that it has some kind of a battle going on. Mm. So, so and we have like, a shotgun as well, so a lot of weaponry. True, we, we do have a lot of uh, gunfighting, it seems like. Um, now, what do you think it means on the third line, you and I win again? What would be the winning here? Is it just winning the war, winning the battle? You know, being able to go through the town, as you put it, literally killing them all and, and bloodshed everywhere. Is that the, the winning aspect of it? So either it's having uh, being a survivor, like because everyone uh, else is dead, you either survived. Uh, so either you survived or you didn't die. So you basically have uh, those two angles or you can kind of uh, you've won the battle uh, wrestling with yourself about the act of killing something and you're OK with yourself after doing that. Wow. Okay, let me let me kind of throw a, a monkey wrench into this one, just to kind of see how you would interpret it if I give you this added detail. What if I told you this verse was about, or at least addressed to, a woman? What if it was a, a significant other? 
of sorts. Now, how would you interpret this whole thing, knowing that you're basically the, the narrator or the voice, the active voice, is talking to a woman? So painting the town red. Definitely sure fertility. Expected. Definitely fertility. <laughs> I'm just kidding. No, but no, that just it, means it, from her uh, fertility, it killed everyone. <laughs> Scarlet letter or something like. Yeah. Oh, well, maybe you know. Well, if it's if it's a woman they're addressing to, then they have a lot of negative emotions coming forth, and there's a lot of blame being thrown around. And I said, but then you said you and I win again, so they've kind of joined forces and they're okay with each other then. So maybe he's after this career, so they're like, or they're co-murderers or something. So it's mm. basically Bonnie and Clyde. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, so so Don had a great question. Say that one more time. I think you were asking. Oh, I was gonna say maybe he's a feminist of some sort, right? If we uh, what what, what gives you what gives you? A well, I mean, if, if he's with them, where they painted the town red, and you know they're conquering, and he's supportive of this woman that he's talking to, and. You know, you and I went again. They align in their uh, beliefs, rather. Maybe, maybe. I think more like, more like a co-conspirator or more like mm. a supporter. Because mm. I guess okay. feminist, that's more like equal rights. And if you killed a bunch of people, you probably killed a bunch of women as well. Oh, that, that makes sense. Yeah, that makes sense. So, so then that wouldn't uh, that would have a lot of uh, loopholes there. Mm. You're but right. if it's addressing a woman, I think they're kind of confused. Oh. Uh, they, they've kind of painted the town red, so they've committed all these atrocities. And then they win again, so they're okay with it mentally. And they're best friends till their last breath, so so that could be like a uh, like a Romeo and Julia type of story. That they kind uh, of die, die in each other's ah, arms. That's interesting. That's interesting. So yeah. taking that a little bit further, you know, with the next few lines, it seems like you're kind of living life on the edge, right? Yes. So no, it could be a retrospective that they could be dying themselves, like live by the gun, die by the gun, and the last breath line. So that's probably hinting towards the kind of dying words. And oh. then they're kind of recapping, like the live by the sea, live by the young, take from the rich, give to the poor. So they felt like what they were doing was noble in some which way. And they kind of ride shotguns, so they're side by side in the car. And they use the with our crossbow, so there's that collective element there. So now, now Zen, if we were yeah. to take it just one step further, right? Do you think this is a literal death between the man and the woman, or do you think this is more of a death of a a friendship or death of a relationship, perhaps? So, uh, if we take that angle, I think we look at uh, everyone in the town's dead, as in. This actually it goes back to Neon Genesis. They have a thing called uh, the Hedgehog's Dilemma, which is explored a lot in that series, where you don't want to get close to other people because you because you're prickly and you might spike them. So in this uh, scenario, if everyone in the town's dead uh, refers to your perception of everyone else through your own uh, your mind's eye, then uh, this victory over all that and this living by the edge can uh, more so be addressed as something more more metaphorical and something you can kind of handle on the inside without actual actual deaths occurring so you're kind of dealing with uh any negative energies there hmm. and and you know to follow this up you'd be surprised but this poet has one more verse for you to interpret so here is the the second verse and just go ahead and read that one time for the audience and then we'll dive right into it your face looked so sweet, even in the wars. You took the rap from me, but I fell on my own sword. And now the sordid details are all over page four. Honey, we made the news, and that's all we did this for. We drove for centuries without a sound or fuss. State peten penitentiaries were made for souls like us. There will be blood, but you will be loved. The world will know, but it's only us. Wow, that was a powerful finish to this interesting poem so zan what do you think is going on let's go bar by bar line by line starting with the first one what do you think is happening okay so the first line uh, looks like uh you know the phrase war paint uh no i don't what is war paint so you know like in, in football they, they put that the, uh, the paint on their face i think they mainly do it for like sunlight and all sunlight mm -hmm. protection 
but uh, I guess in wars, they had all this tribal paint they would do on the face to kind of signify their scars, the battle scars, and their whole uh, trajectory of the war, how it's going. Oh, and, like mascara. Uh, they kind of align with their own people, yeah. Okay. So their squad. Got it, got it. Mm -hmm. So the protagonist here is appreciating someone's face, even in the war. So even in the, uh, the arguments in a relationship or uh, literal war battles, if we're referring to a war, you took the rap from me, but I fell on my own sword. So if we're looking at like a legal drama, then someone uh, took the blame. So they uh, marked themselves guilty. But even in doing so, the protagonist fell on their own sword. So they somehow injured themselves. Even when else someone else takes the blame, they're still injuring themselves. And now the sordid details all over page four. So I believe page four is a tabloid thing. And it usually has these kind of murder rap, these kind of stories that are just there for clicks, there to kind of strike up emotion. Uh, honey, we made the news and that's all we did this for. So that just goes back to the whole uh, wanting to be a headline, wanting that uh, uh, 15 minutes of fame. We drove centuries without a sound or fuss. State penitentiaries weren't made for souls like us. So I believe uh, they're not certain that their crime was uh, something to uh, deserve this entire uh, jail sentence. And it's hard to define with a state penitentiary punishment. There will be blood, but you will be loved. The world will know, but it's only us. So it seems like it's talking about like crimes of passion, maybe that uh, people will kill for their loved ones. Be, be it war, be it a relationship, be it trying to get out of a murder case or a trial. And uh, mm -hmm. the world might know a certain aspect of it, but only they will know the full story. Hmm. Wow. Wow. So um, would you say that overall this was a, a nice collection of verses for a, a poem about a man and a woman, their trials and tribulations, their experiences through whatever it may be, through, you know, problems, difficulties in relationships, or even dealing with the press, dealing with media. Did you like this overall? I thought it was really good. Have you seen the film uh, Chicago, uh, 2002, I think it is? I've actually uh, never seen the film and I've never been to the city. Right, so that's a musical about uh, a kind of like a sci-fi <laughs> lawyer who has these uh, jilted uh, lover type clients who basically kill their husbands, and he kind of has to represent them on the stand. So he's a master at you know manipulating the media, creating the circus ah. uh, to kind of help the clients you know uh, get sympathy from the jury and get off on a light sentence. So this really reminds uh -huh. me of that that movie. But I think uh, just the word choice, stick up kids, a lot of things, uh, the crossbow. And then the, the state penitentiaries, and then going from a, my own sword to sordid details. I think that was very apt. Just the word choice is really good. I feel like it could have been very uh, uh, generic the way it started, but I felt like it, it kind of took us on a journey. And it kind of changed uh, the meaning of the poem. But just in, when you introduced the new verses, it totally kind of flipped what I thought the poem was about. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Did, it, did it kind of seem like the new verse should have gone before the first one? Like the second one should have came before the first. Or Not necessarily. It... Oh, really? Interesting. Interesting. I feel so... like it's kind of unstuck in time. Like it kind of is a really revealing verse, uh -huh. but the first can kind of be a standalone on its own. But this uh -huh. kind of gives you a full picture of the whole thing. Uh -huh. Interesting. Because yeah. the well... page for short story details and state penitentiaries, that brings the legal aspect and the media aspect like uh, up front and center. It's kind of hard to avoid that. You bring up some great points, and I think you know now would be the time to explain where this is from. So sure. there is a artist, very talented young man, by the name of Rally Ritchie. That's R A L E I G H, Ritchie, R I T C H I E, and he is uh, probably best known as the actor that played uh, Grey Worm on Game of Thrones. He played like a kind of like a, a soldier you know, from a different land. And uh, I didn't know it at the time, but he was very, you know, into music. He has his own, you know, 
uh, hit records, he uploads on YouTube, he dances, he does a little bit of everything. And so a friend of mine uh, brought this to my attention today, like, hey, you know, this might be interesting to have someone interpret, you know, because Riley Ritchie, he has a lot of different metaphors and, and imagery, as Zan, you so noticeably pointed out. And uh, it would be cool to have somebody like yourself, Zan, who does do poetry on the side, who does have a very lyrical mind, so to speak. You have a lot of, you know, references and connections that you'd like to tie together to see your take on what Rowley Ritchie could do. And this is actually from a song called The Last Romance. So you can uh, you can check this out at a later time. Um, it's uh, the song itself. You may or may not like it, depending on, you know, if you enjoy that that brand of music. It's a little bit on the, you know, kind of like an R&B pop, hip hop side. But uh, yeah, we just wanted to get your thoughts on it. And I'm glad you were able to break this down for us. Because when I first read it, I, I didn't know what to make of it at first. You know, I, I had a feeling as to what it was about. But to hear your interpretation, especially with the, uh, the fertility dresses and the blood everywhere and the, uh, you know, focusing on the state penitentiary and all the different imagery and wordplay, that was really cool. So thank you, Zan, for that breakdown, that astute analysis of Rally Ritchie's The Last Romance. Um, Did he ever release his own uh, feelings about it, or is this kind of up to up to anyone? You know, I, I think like any true artist, um, his own feelings, of course, stem from sadness, probably from his personal dealings with this woman. Maybe it was a relationship that was amazing that had everything he could ever ask for, but ultimately just didn't work out for multiple reasons. But as with all good artists and good music, I think the piece of art that's in front of us is always open to interpretations. It could very much be about war, as you pointed out initially. It could be about somebody else's relationship. You could see something in this song, the pain, the brilliance, whatever it is that can relate to your life. And so I, I oftentimes think, uh, the, the really good artists out there, whether it's, uh, you know, a Zan rocking the ones and twos, because I know, Zan, you like to get down a little bit with some raps every now and then, or whether it's uh, Don. You know, Don has some bars as well. You know, uh, what, what was that one line you like to say? A, C, G, and T. Now it's on YouTube. <laughs> right? right? So they're about the DNA. The, so, yeah, the coding about the DNA. DNA. <laughs> and, 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 there you go. And, and the thing is, you never know what could come out of it. From that bar alone, we actually came up with the name of this group, SoCal DNA. And so it's really interesting how, you know, creativity can happen anytime. And even looking at other people's work can inspire us to do something creative. And so we hope that, uh, you know, after breaking down this one, Zan, maybe you get inspired to, you know, take out the old pen and paper and uh, <laughs> write up something yourself. And maybe next time we have you around. Uh, you'll be able to share something that you came up with, something original from the mind of Zen. So, uh, you know, we just want to say thank you for hanging out with us today. This was an extended episode, but rightfully so. I mean, there's always so much to talk about, so much more to talk about. We covered a plethora of topics from anime to, uh, you know, different food, like where the food scene is going, and to even music. And we, we skimmed through politics a little bit. Didn't really touch on that too much, probably for the best. But uh, Zan, how, how did you how did you enjoy yourself today? Did you have a good time? Yeah, I was just uh, looking at the the poem again, and just a new idea came to mind with the paint of the town red line. Uh -huh. oh, okay. So I was uh, just after the context you've given, uh, and just about this rapper, just kind of looking at his order. So the your face line was actually at the big the top of the poem. So given that at the top, the paint of the town red could also refer to bloodshot eyes, and kind of uh dealing with kind of like your 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 whole uh, vision in front of you is turning red because you're so uh, disturbed or pained or bludgeoned that that everyone in the town's dead is more meaning uh, the your perception that your whole world around you is kind of gone rather than actual people you know and and that's the beautiful part about interpretation sometimes uh you know we have to read something twice to really understand what's happening. And every time we read it again and again, we find hidden gems. I happen to do that all the time with Pusha T songs, with Red Hot Chili Peppers music. And Zan has shown us that even a little bit of research can open our eyes to new bars, new lyrics. And 
I hope we carry that with us for next time. I hope the audience as well takes something from this episode. I, I hope they find something from this episode. And they, uh, you know, take that with them in their day to day. And, and maybe they'll get inspired to be creative and, and uh, you know, do interesting things in the future. Um, but with that being said, uh, from SoCal DNA featuring Zan, uh, I hope that everyone had a good time. I hope that uh, you guys enjoyed this new dynamic with a, with a guest. It's something new that we tried out today. And uh, let us know your feedback. Let us know your comments. We're always, uh, you know, open ears, uh, waiting to hear what's up. But until next time, this is uh, the A from SoCal DNA signing off.